Hello, hello. All right, so it seems like this is a pretty good topic to be bringing up. It seems like a lot of um, a lot of questions are coming up around this. Like, how do I tell the difference between my fear and my intuition, between maybe self-sabotage and intuition? Um, and this has been a big topic that was something I really had to wrestle with when I was starting to like unwind and untangle. Um, my own dating past and my own dating patterns. Um, so this is going to be a longer live. We're going to dive into all of the things related to fear, intuition, red flags, how do you know the difference. Um, and I'm tying this to dating. So we're going to be looking at this in terms of your dating. So the first thing I want to say is that if you're somebody who has a tendency to, hi Harley, um, to run away from relationships or to stay too long with someone, um, so it's either of those things, those two polarities, um, if you've been burned, if you've been heartbroken, uh, if you've ever been in a more like toxic or abusive sort of situation, um, this is really going to resonate with you and will be really useful. So fear and self-sabotage, I'm kind of tying into the same sort of category here at, versus intuition, okay? Um, so we tend to hear a lot of advice um, around like listening to your gut or your gut instinct or to your intuition. Um, and that can be really confusing um, if you are somebody who does have a tendency to run away or stay too long, miss red flags, see red flags where there not, might not be any, um, that advice is not really helpful advice. So I'm going to talk about what I have figured out is much more useful um, versus that and why actually it's really hard to listen to your gut or your intuition or be able to differentiate the two. Um, the first reason is because if you have a pattern of relationships not working and missing things or running away, um, fear and self-sabotage are going to feel the same as intuition to you. So that's the first thing and that's why it, this is such a tricky topic to be able to figure out for yourself. Um, so first of all, this is really common um, if you are an avoidant attachment style or if you are the opposite end, if you're an anxious attachment style, it's really, really, really common that you're having trouble differentiating between fear and intuition. Um, and that's because both of those attachment styles um, can get overactivated in the attachment system and the nervous system, even though they run in opposite directions. So one of them is wanting more closeness if you're anxious, and the other is wanting more distance if you're avoidant, but they're still the same, it's still the same thing. You're activating that attachment system, which means that you actually cannot tune into your intuition uh, because you've been activated. So if you have avoidant tendencies, you would notice that if somebody starts to get too close to you, then you start looking for reasons to end it and you start feeling really uncomfortable and you might start backing out or pulling away um, and you're finding reasons to end it and to leave. And those reasons, if you actually look back, you'll see aren't really based on real red flags or any real issues, um, not about who that person was at the core. If you're anxious, and you're activated, um, then it's going to seem like if he's creating distance, um, then what you end up doing is you start, and you, he seems to be creating distance, right? Because this is all like our interpretations that may not be the case at all, um, but then you end up overanalyzing everything that he does, being hyper attuned to that person, the person who you are attached to or bonding to, for any sign that he might be distancing himself. And then you start seeing red flags too, or you start self-sabotaging um, because, and I'm gonna talk about why that would show up. So because of this, these two attachment systems, um, you really can't tell the difference up front between a guy who is your perfect partner um, and someone who matches your love blueprint, which if you're having trouble in romantic relationship, then you've got a love blueprint that isn't 
so great and we want to take a look at that and start to work with what's in there um, so you're not able to tell the difference between somebody who's just a really great guy he'd be a perfect partner and someone who's like a perfect match to what you're looking for subconsciously uh, because of what's in your love blueprint so your prototype for an ideal romantic partner and what love feels like or should feel like and what a relationship feels like and should look like what you can and cannot have what's possible what's not possible all of that is kind of operating below the surface um, for you because of the coding and the the blueprint that you've got for relationships so first of all um if you're looking for chemistry or like some kind of instant connection um, what you're subconsciously looking for is going to be someone who's a match for whatever you have as a blueprint for what love is. So if you have been, unattract or been attracted to unavailable men up until now or a certain type of person, um, that's the person who you're going to feel that instant chemistry with, that instant connection. So it's really just replaying the same pattern that you've had all along up until now. Um, because that's what your subconscious says love is so you see him and you're like ding like perfect person perfect match and it's all in the subconscious like operating behind the scene because of patterning that we have this comes from childhood this comes from conditioning from society from movies from family from friends from experiences that we've had and all of these things that we've started to collect and that makes up what we're looking for in a person and typically it's not super useful and it's not actually what you really want or what you might need actually from a partner. Um, so this then plays out in who we are attracted to, who we attract in and how a relationship actually plays out as well. So we're programmed to keep repeating the same relationship patterns with the same types of men, unless there's some kind of intervention, like an overhaul, rewiring, recoding of what's going on in there. Um, so to do this, we often have to choose someone who might actually feel like you're going against your gut instinct or your intuition, um, which is really just what is in your love blueprint. Um, what feels natural to you is what's in your love blueprint. Um, so that you can actually break that patterning if you've noticed this pattern not being to your benefit. So when you haven't done a ton of like the inner work and the self exploration and don't know what's in that love blueprint, you can easily justify running from someone or staying too long um, because you're going to be seeing red flags when there may not actually be any um, or you might actually miss red flags because um, this person is such a match for your love blueprint that you don't see the things or you overlook the things that you actually should be noticing and paying attention to because that's what you're coded for wanting in a person. So for example, um, with my boyfriend, when I first met him, it was January 2017 and I was just barely beginning to like scrape the surface of starting to understand what goes on with love blueprint and um, coding and all of those things that I didn't know um, were operating there. So I met him, he was like a super nice guy. I was instantly like, I liked him. I was like, I like him, he's really cute. He seems like a nice guy. And I was like noticing all these things that I did like. Um, but then we went on three dates and I started to be like, oh, like, I just like, there's something missing. Like there's some like chemistry. It's not strong enough. Like there's just something missing. And, um, so I ended up like not seeing him again. We went on three dates and I was like, yeah, he's a really nice guy, but like the X factor is not there. And I remember my roommate's fiance, um, like, I think he just saw, he, I told him something about the guy who had been going on a few dates with, and he was like, oh, look at his Facebook profile. Um, and he goes instantly, he's like, oh, I really like him. You need to give him a chance. Like, he could really be the one. <laughs> and I ended up pulling out instead. So that was it. Um, two months went by, and then he shows up in my dance class. And from a distance, I started being like, oh yeah, actually I really like him. We started talking again, you know, and then slowly it became a thing again. But in between that January and then the two months later when he showed up in my dance class, 
I had done a ton of personal work. And one thing that I had realized when I had this pattern of being irresistibly attracted to men who I subconsciously knew were unavailable and wouldn't last. So I realized like the reason I had said, oh, that X factor is missing. The X factor was actually like the fear or the adrenaline rush that like this person's actually unavailable and it's going to leave. And that was what in my system felt like a really good romantic connection. And so to break that, I actually had to go into the feeling of like, this is kind of calm and easy and it doesn't have all the drama and all the turmoil that I was used to. But then another piece of the story, which is really important to start to see how the how intuition, red flags, how that plays out when you haven't detangled all of the parts of your love blueprint and all of the, the patterning and the things that have happened and the way you carry that with you into your next dating experience, into your next relationship, um, was that not too, too long into, you know, starting to date again, maybe a month or so, I don't remember exactly, um, he started to get like more attached to me than I was to him at that point because I was so guarded still. I had so much, so many walls to still break down um, that he started to get a little bit more attached and me, my attachment system freaked out because I have both the avoidant and the anxious depending on my partner and where they are and where I'm feeling. So I can, I can be avoidant or I could be anxious and it kind of depends on in the moment. So or on the partner, what's going on. So he started to get more attached to me and I freaked out. So there was like one night he drove me home from dance class and I just, I was kind of, I don't know, I was closing off basically. And I guess he sensed that and he was like, you know, I really need to use the bathroom. Can I come in and use the bathroom? And I was like, no, <laughs> like I didn't want him to come in and use the bathroom. Cause I was like, oh, then he's gonna wanna talk to me. And I just like wanted to have my space, my alone time. Um, but I ended up letting him come in and then, you know, he wanted to talk in the kitchen and like it totally, totally triggered me, um, because of past traumas that I had with an ex. And so I didn't just like run, but I was like furious and triggered like nobody's business for like days afterwards and like putting all this stuff on what had happened and what that meant. And so during that time, what became really important for me, because I was aware that I had this pattern of pushing away people who might actually be really good partners for me, um, was that I needed to like take some space and just observe within me what was going on and also observe how he responded to me. So during that time, I think I like kind of pulled away. I, I told him I was upset, angry, but I, I didn't, I wasn't able at that time to express why or to actually sit down and have a conversation about what had happened. Um, that would come later as I started to do more and more of that work for myself. Um, so during that time, all I did was I like pulled way back. We were still going to the same dance class, which was kind of awkward. Um, but I just wanted to observe basically what happens um, when I pull away because in my previous experience with this ex that had kind of triggered that um, when he had started to get closer to me was that um, that ex would not respect the distance that I asked for, the space that I asked for. Um, you know, we'd broken up and he had kind of like called and called and called and texted and messaged and like it was um, a total violation of my boundaries. So I, I needed to see what happens if I pull away. Does he respect my boundaries? And so what happened was he did, he totally did respect my boundaries. He didn't keep coming toward me. He didn't keep pushing anything. Um, he kind of backed off, backed up, didn't chase, gave me my space. Um, and in observing that response, I saw, okay, this guy is actually somebody who does have emotional regulation. Um, he is able to give me my space, respect my boundaries. Um, he's actually not going to fall apart if I go away for a little bit, um, which was something that had not been the case with my other ex. And so all of the red flags that had popped up, I had thought I saw with him that night when he had, you know, wanted to come in and talk and hang out didn't happen. And so what's really important to notice about that is that in the moment when I was triggered and he had done something, I had interpreted it as meaning something about him and the way the relationship was going to go. 
um, and was totally triggered and freaked out. But then giving that space, I was able to then observe myself and observe him. How does he respond to me when I do what I need to do? Um, and I learned a lot about whether or not this would actually be a healthy relationship, whether or not it would be something um, that would be safe, because I was really looking for safety, um, would be safe for me to actually pursue further. So the other thing that I noticed in myself, because he didn't chase, because he gave me my space, um, because he didn't put pressure on me, didn't use any manipulation or emotional emotionality to try to get me back in any way, um, was that I started to come toward him again. And I started to like be jealous if he would talk to another girl at dance class. And I was like, well, this is so weird because I was the one who like totally pulled away and didn't want to talk and was super mad. And now I'm like wanting to come toward him again. And it's this dance that you sometimes go through in the beginning. You need to feel it out, right? It's this dance of push, a little bit push and pull. Um, and you want to see, is this person at equal footing with me? And so what he'd realized when I'd freaked out that night and then got really mad and pulled away was that um, he was not matching me where I was. And this is important. You want to look for someone and you want to make sure you're doing this yourself. In the beginning, you need to match each other where you are. So you don't want someone who's like 10 steps ahead of where you are. You need to like match the level of commitment, the level of investment, the level of readiness. Um, and so what happened was he pulled back and started matching me and then the attraction and the wanting to be with him could come back again. So I thought that I'd seen all these red flags. I told my friends all these things about what I had seen and this is why I'm really mad and this is why I'm not sure anymore and I'm questioning everything. Um, because I was projecting what I was carrying with me from my ex onto him and what his behavior meant or what he had done, what that meant. And so I would see all these red flags because I was carrying that unhealed past with me. And this is what always happens. Um, if we don't clear that stuff out, if we don't deal with it, if we don't heal the stuff that came from that, then we end up carrying that with us into the next relationship in the next one, the next one, the next one. And it could be just met a guy. But if you had somebody who left you or abandoned you earlier on and you haven't actually cleared out and done the work around that, then you're going to project that onto that person if they need to take space. Suddenly you're triggered and thinking, oh my God, they're pulling away and they're not going to come back. Um, so this is why being able to tell the difference between your intuition and the red flags requires a lot of self-awareness and a lot of awareness and healing work done around what has happened in the past. So the other thing that I want to say is, well, so first of all, the first rule about intuition if we were to extrapolate what happened there is that when emotions are involved, it's not likely your intuition. In fact, it's like never your intuition. It's like an activated um, nervous system response. It's an activated attachment system. It's your activated fear systems. Um, and so you can't know what the right move to do is until you can deregulate and downregulate your nervous system and actually get back to a more balanced space. And that takes as long as it takes. It took me three weeks. Um, how do you clear emotional back? Uh, yeah, I'll get to that. Um, so you need to first just step back. And it's really important that you can communicate that you're stepping back to the person you're stepping back from so that you don't suddenly trigger their activated attachment systems. And this can be really, really, really tricky when you're triggered yourself. So, you know, with Eric and I, it was like, not a clean, nice way of communicating. Like, hey, I'm triggered. I was really mad at him. I kind of stormed away, like didn't want to talk to him, told me to leave me alone. Like it was not nice. But the one thing I was able to communicate is I'm really mad right now. I just need my space. And I've asked him later, like, how did, how did you think through that or work through that when I suddenly just like did that? And he was like, well, the one thing that gave me hope and actually made me think maybe if she does come back, I would like try to work this out with her is that I was willing to actually communicate about something that was going on in my internal world. Um, and then I had to do a whole bunch of work to be able to get to a place where I could be more open because my big thing, um, 
was I had tons and tons of walls, like so much protection around me that I would see red flags all the time. I was pulling away all the time. Um, and that was a lot of the work that I had to do was where do those walls come from and how can I start to release them and let them go so I actually can be with someone and communicate with someone and trust someone because for me, trust and safety had been violated in the past. Um, and so it took us so many tiny baby steps to get to move forward because I had to keep observing how does he respond? How does he respond? Um, because of all the stuff that had happened that I was still working on clearing when we met. And as we met, I had to really clear a lot of that um, in order for us to work out. So um, another example I've got, and this is kind of like the before you would know what your bl love blueprint is, this is kind of how the pattern works. Um, so I... I was always attracted to unavailable guys or guys who would eventually leave. Like that was the guy I would always fall for. That was the guy I always had the instant connection and the chemistry with. Um, and of course that all came from a love blueprint, which I'll talk about where that came from for me. Um, so before Eric, I had dated another guy and I'd like super fast fallen for him and all the things. Um, but what happened, because this is what happens when you have a, a love blueprint match, it's like, and you haven't cleared out your love blueprint to make sure that like what you're attracted to is healthy. Um, I had, he was like a perfect match for my love blueprint. And so I didn't see any direct red flags, but I saw things that set me on edge and I chose to ignore it. Um, as happens when we haven't cleared out that love blueprint. So he, for example, had mentioned how important his independent was to him, his independence was to him. Um, he was pretty much a closed book about his previous relationships. Like I couldn't get a whole lot from him about that when I would ask. Um, he would use humor to deflect like real harder, more serious conversations. So we couldn't go very far. We couldn't go very deep into anything with each other. It would be a lot of fun. And then that deeper place we could not get to. Um, and then he wouldn't commit really like we had so much fun together and you know, he'd say to me like because I asked him straight out I was like, so Do you eventually want a relationship and he'd been like, oh my gosh Like I have so much fun with you, but I'm not ready for a relationship right now, which is what you're gonna hear from an unavailable man um, and Along with the other signs, right? That's not the only one like maybe you need to wait a little longer, but you're going to you'll see other signs that also hint at the unavailability, right? Like some of the things that I mentioned showed up with that guy. Um, and he was pretty much a textbook avoidant in that sense. He was also older than me. I think he was like um, 35 or 34 when we met. And, you know, questions about why, right? Um, never married, right? So questions about why. Um, but I felt so hard for him because that was in my love blueprint. Avoidance were my perfect match. Um, men who could not commit for whatever reason fully 100% were my perfect match. Um, so I thought at the time, and this is like the thing that will come up if you are like on that pole with me, falling for those avoidant men, um, is that like if I'm patient enough, if I don't scare him away, if I don't push too much, he's gonna come around, right? Like I'm gonna figure out how he works and I'm gonna like figure out how to get him to work for me, right? Like um, that eventually he'd let me in, that eventually he'd open up. And so what happened, as does happen, is that eventually he kind of just like faded out. And you know, I didn't want to be putting in more than he was, so then there would be long periods with no texting and less planning and less planning until it was just like sometimes a message and then you know, I just, it just fades, right? Um, and so what I learned is I was like, what the heck happened? I've got to heal this. Cause this was actually the, the trigger for me to start doing all of this work was like, what the heck is happening? I feel like this happens every time that I really seem to be attracted to men who are unavailable, who disappear. Um, and so I started to dig into, started to do the work around my love blueprint. Um, to figure out what was the pattern that was repeating here? What was causing this pattern to repeat? Cause I saw it was a pattern. And I was like, I don't know how to 
not fall for that person. I don't know how to break this. Um, and so as I started to do the work around my love blueprint, I found that I had a core belief um, that all the men that I really like will eventually leave me. And when I really dug there, it was actually a core wound um, that my, my dad had died when I was five. And I'd gone through, until that point, had gone through my life being like, I'm totally fine, that did not affect me. <laughs> like, I have a stepdad, love my stepdad, like, I was so young, never affected me. And then I started to do that work and was like, oh, I've got this belief from so, 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 so long ago that I didn't even know I was carrying that I keep repeating in my life because that's in my love blueprint that comes from my dad dying. And I didn't know that that was the core of it. So until I found that, it was like everything clicked into place. Click, 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 click. And until I had figured that out, I couldn't quite get it. Like I couldn't quite figure out how to shift it because I was like, that's a pattern and how do I shift it? When I found that, first of all, it was like huge release. Like I was just sobbing, but it was like relief. It wasn't like sadness. It was like, oh my God, that's what it was. And now it's, now it's just, it can be released. Finally. Um, I remember calling my mom and being like, this is it. This is what's been happening. Like this is, I didn't even know. And it was just, it cleared. That was how it cleared for me. There are many ways you can start to clear these things. That was because that was so deep there, I didn't even know it was there. That was the big one, like the huge one. But there was so much more beyond that because these patterns that we carry create things in our relationships. Um, and then there's stuff from those relationships that then we carry. So it kind of becomes layer upon layer upon layer. So there was that. I realized that I was basically creating a self-fulfilling prophecy because of the men I would choose and also how it would show up based on the belief that I had at the back of my head that he's going to disappear, right? There are also things that I would do that would create that. Um, so it's kind of a two-way thing. So I saw that then I might start to get more clingy if a guy started to get more distant or maybe even angry or demanding, right? Like there are different ways that that would show up. Uh, in response to what he was doing. And so it was like a mix of behavior plus the kind of guy, right? Created that self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so it was interesting with this one and several of the other ones, I think all of them that disappeared was that they actually would come back again. About six months later, they'd show up back in my life again before disappearing for good. And it would be like that test, like, um, are you going to fall for that again? or not. <laughs> um, so that would always be the pattern as well. So I would see these red flags, I would see the problem, I could ignore them because I think I'm going to be the one who's going to figure this guy out, I'm going to be the one who'd break through to his heart, I'm going to figure out what's the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do and I'm not going to make a mistake <laughs> because I really wanted these men and that's that was just part of the patterning or how it would play out because of that core belief, because of that core wound and the things that would happen because of that afterwards. Um, so when I had found that, I had started to really study attraction and men and dating and like most of the stuff I was reading was really all advice about how to keep an avoidant man. Um, and I didn't know at the time about attachment style, so it would just have been unavailable man would have been what I would think in my head. Um, but. It, in my head also would be like, that's all men, because I filtered out anyone who wouldn't fit that love blueprint. So there had been some super nice, super stable, super secure men who'd entered my life and I dated for a little bit. And what would happen inevitably would be, first of all, I'd be like, I'm just not super attracted. And the other thing is that I would freak out because he was so there, so secure, not going anywhere. Um, then I decide I wasn't attracted and I just had to end it and I'd run away from them um, because they were not my love blueprint type at the time because I didn't know that that was the pattern that was playing out. So then we get to Eric, same sort of thing, really stable, really secure, really nice guy and I'm three dates gone. Then we start dating again and now another part is triggered which came from experiences with an ex and I'm wanting to run away. Um, so that's why I say I have the avoidant and the anxious style. It depends on the person and that's pretty common for most people. Um, so you actually have to know to get back to 
intuition. Um, in order to know whether you've got real red flags or not, you have to know your love blueprint like inside and out. You've got to know what your triggers are. You've got to know the belief system that's at play when you're with someone, your love blueprint coding basically, um, or it will feel like intuition, it will feel like a red flag when it's not. Um, you need to have that level of self-awareness of what's operating, um, what are those subconscious beliefs that you've got going on, you've got to start working to rewire them. What are the wounds that you're still carrying? And you've got to heal those things. Like for me, that was my dad. Um, and of course, there's other wounds. We all have so many wounds that we carry from childhood. It doesn't matter how good your childhood was. You've got stuff that you decided about yourself because of what happened. And you're carrying that with you. And that's playing out in how you are showing up in these relationships and your emotions and everything. Um, what are your self-sabotaging behaviors? because then you can consciously choose not to keep repeating them. Like for me, that would have been running away, right? That would have been one of them or choosing the avoidant men and then thinking I could change them or that they'd stay, right? So that or change myself so that they would want to stay, right? Like all of those patterns, you've got to be aware of what's going on so you can actually make a different choice. And I'm going to say it's not simple. It's not easy. It can be very demanding, scary work. It takes a lot of courage because once you find the pattern, you've actually got to go out and take a different action in your life, right? I had to go toward Eric and actually open up and tell him, hey, this is what go this was what was going on when I didn't talk to you for those three weeks, which is super awkward and immature of me. Um, I had to actually open up and tell him, hey, I had this trigger, this happened in a past relationship, I put that on you, I'm sorry, this is, this is going to be there, I'm still working through it. Like, it takes determination not to give up because you can notice, oh my god, I just did that same pattern again, I just self-sabotaged, I just had that trigger, um, I missed that red flag, and you just want to give up. Well, you can't give up because the only way to rewire and recode all that love blueprinting is you've got to go in there, you've got to figure out what it is, you've got to do the work with yourself alone, and then you've got to go out and put it to practice. And that's hard and scary and uncomfortable to do. So it takes guts. It's not easy. Um, sometimes you're going to have to do things that will scare the shit out of you. That you're like, I've never done this before. I'm not sure how that's going to end up. I'm not sure if this is going to work. And you've got to take the leap. You've got to try because you're rewiring an entire nervous system, entire belief system that you've been operating on your whole life. So this is what we call transformation versus just reading about it in a book. You can read about attachment, but then to actually try to rewire that for yourself is a whole nother level. So... I'm going to try to think if there's anything else I want to say about this. Um, yeah, it's a dance. It really is a dance. You're not going to know if the person that you're with right away, you're not going to know if they're the right person. If you're working through rewiring and recoding your love blueprint and healing some of those things and those patterns, it's not going to be clear from the beginning. You're going to have to observe and watch and try and try and communicate really well. Um, and become aware of what's coming up in the moment and then what do I need to do? How do I need to respond to what's coming up for me? Um, it's a whole process. It's not something that is one and done. Um, and it, it's, it's really a dance with yourself and with another person um, to begin to untangle and then rewire. So Brenda, um, how do you clear the emotional baggage from the past? Um, there are so, so many different ways that you can begin to clear that. Um, if you want to message me, uh, we can talk more like specifically what it is for you and how that shows up. Or you can tell me, I don't know if you're still watching, you can tell me here. Um, but there's, it depends on how it's showing up for you. Um, there are a lot of different ways that I work with my clients on this to start to rewire and clear out that emotional baggage and the stuff that you're carrying. So many, so many different ways, and it really is often dependent on the person that I'm working with, what, what's gonna work for them, because not one way 
is right for everybody. Some some people are going to work much better with one modality or method and others are going to work much better with a different one. Um, so it, it does depend on on you a little bit, like how what you're responding to and what's working for you. Um, like, for example, for me, I did I spent a lot of time in meditation and I would get to I call it dropping in, but it's essentially I would I would sit still. Sometimes I used guided meditations until I got really good at this on my own. Um, but until a point where I would call it when you feel like you've dropped in, what's essentially happened is that your brain waves have dropped into an um, an alpha. What's the one above that? Theta alpha state. Um, so that's below like typically what you are at at waking, which is like. Um, much stronger or like um, intense brain waves. I think that's delta is when you're waking. Um, so you you've dropped below that, and it's you're sort of in a different consciousness at that point. Um, and so you have access to your subconscious and and like the wiring that's in place. Um, this works for some people. It worked really well for me. And then I would I'd get into that state, and then I could start to work with what was there and start to uncover what was there because that was how I figured out. Um, that like core wounding that I had for my dad that I didn't even know I was carrying. Um, so that's one way. Um, but it looks like maybe you're not here right now. So you, you can also, you can message me or you can respond here. Um, that's one way that I work through it. There are lots of other ways that you can work with someone through it, which are the ways that I work with my clients. Um, but do you guys have any other questions? Questions about anything or how it's showing up for you that you just want like a clarification on? Happy to answer those right now. Oh, you are here. Yeah. So, um, Brenda, what what is it that comes up for you? And what have you tried so far? And sometimes it, you know, it will get triggered by a particular situation. So you don't know that you've got that stuff that you're carrying until it's triggered. Um, and then it's time to like, take a look at what's there. Can't get over your ex. Um, Brenda, message me because this is something that I work with my clients on. Um, and we could totally, we could totally work together on that. Um, yeah, cause that's like, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Um, there's probably a part of you that doesn't want to let go. Um, so you've got to do some work with the part of you that, that isn't willing to let go of that. Um, there are different ways to do it. You can work with that part in isolation. You can just work with, with everything and how you're perceiving the whole situation. Um, Different tapping is the modality that, that some people use. Um, but yeah, this is something I work with my clients on. So message me if you want to work on that because that's, we can totally clear that. Um, okay, Sonia, how do you deal with feeling frustrated with yourself for seeing the same triggers coming over and over again? Um, so something that I found really, really powerful for working with triggers um, this is literally from my experience because I would get triggered all the time um, in relationship and dating. Poor Eric, he put up with so much. <laughs> um, is you, you've got different parts, right? These are different parts from different ages. And you can tune into what part is getting triggered. And you can start to work with that part. Um, to just ask it, you know, how old is it? Where is it coming from? What is it trying to protect you from? And start to start to get curious about the the triggers that are coming up and and looking into it because you're you're gonna find that it's probably tied to a, a much bigger like tree. Like all of all of the little triggers, like they're all attached to something more central or more core. Um, so I would just start to explore where it's coming from. Um, Cause other it's like whack-a-mole, but you, if you can figure out what the, like the root below that is, then you can get rid of all the like little whack-a-mole that keeps popping up. Um, 
and you know working with those different parts within yourself that keep getting triggered um get get curious about what's going on and what they're trying to protect you from because they're they don't come up because they hate you right like it comes up because it's actually self-protection um and maybe some story that you carry about yourself um that you want to start taking a look at um and rewiring the story that's coming up you guys have any other questions also did did that answer your question brenda and sonia was that helpful If, if you're good, then I, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Perfect. Yeah. So I'm going to sign off, but I hope you ladies have a beautiful rest of your day and take care of yourselves and I will see you soon. Bye.